Now, Patrick Mahomes is not going to be available on your waiver wire. However, half a passing yard square is available for Patrick Mahomes on underdog fantasy. So literally, if you get on the platform and you sign up using BDGE on there, you will get half a yard. He needs to throw for one yard on Thursday Night Football against the banged up Chargers, okay? I didn't need to put banged up in there. He's going to throw for one single yard. They just want you on the platform, okay? So they're giving you one passing yard as a free square on underdog fantasy. When you sign up with our code BDGE, deposit $10 or more. You've got a free square to bet on. You'll also get access to our waiver wire rankings for the rest of the year. Absolutely free. You get the big dog membership through week 18. Let's talk week four waiver wire on the left side you will see the most added players in fantasy football over the last 24 36 48 hours on the right side you'll see a lot of guys that have been dropped we will talk our way through there as well as interjecting any dudes that are not on the trending tab that i think you should be keeping an eye on for this week's waiver wire atop the list we have the goat the god the king himself joan jennings who popped off for one of the greatest fantasy games uh of all time it was the best single fantasy game of the season thus far 46 and a half PPR points. Shout out to me for starting him and your idiot league mates. How you doing? Juwan Jennings, here's the deal. He's rostered in most places. Like some of the guys on the left side here, the trending up, the most added players, we're just going to skim past them and just add a note by saying unserious league. If I say unserious league, they're probably owned in like 60% of leagues, and we don't actually have to waste our time talking about them, okay? Juwan Jennings is getting there. I think maybe people were hesitant to pick him up. He was our number one waiver wire wide receiver pickup of last week, so hopefully a lot of you guys got him and ended up starting him. He popped off. Debo's obviously out. C-Max out. George Kittle's out. I expect Debo to miss another game. Kittle is more likely to play this week than Debo, but it does not mean either of them will be active. So if both of them are out again, he's obviously a must start against the New England Patriots. I think if one of them plays, right, he obviously starts to get a little bit riskier as the more pieces get added back in. You'd love to just say, okay, this is a one for one situation. The math adds up. He just had a really good game. He should earn more playing time. The problem is, like, this offense is just littered with all pro pass catchers. So when Kittle's back, when Debo is back, Ayuk just got 30 mil. Like, there's not really a place for Juwan Jen- Jennings to have a statistical ceiling on a week-to-week basis, unfortunately. juwan has been on the team for a while. We knew what he was. We knew what his role is prior to these guys getting hurt. Now, in a matchup against New England where you'll probably have Christian Gonzalez stamp to Brandon Ayuk, that leaves him probably running open again. Uh, obviously, you know, a defensive-minded team like New England is going to look at their game plan and say, like, we can't have what happened last week to Jawan happen again. So maybe they shift things around. But Ayuk is their main is their main purpose there. And last week we saw Christian Gonzalez travel with Garrett Wilson on Thursday Night Football the entire game. So I expect the same treatment. That being said, if Jawan Jennings is available on your waiver wire, I, I don't want to overthink it, but I also don't want to overspend given the fact that, like, he might be a two-week rental. When Debo and George Kittle get back, uh, Jawan Jennings goes back to like a pretty desperate flex play. Maybe he sneaks into like the low end wide receiver three conversation, but that's not something you want to be spending 25% of your fab on. If he's available on my waiver wire right now, I would probably throw in 15%. Like that's probably the max that I would uh, end up throwing in on him right now. He can help you win this week. And then, you know, obviously, as the weeks pass, he gets riskier and riskier as a play that you could throw in your lineup with the competition coming back. So you want to own him, but I wouldn't go crazy spending a ton of fab on him if you already missed out on the big week. I think he could be a nice wide receiver, two for this week, maybe a wide receiver three the next week. But when those other guys are back, like his target numbers will start to diminish rapidly. The other thing to consider as you're starting to look at the waiver wire, as you're starting to look at backup players, as we're starting to look at, you know, the rest of your roster I don't think a lot of people are looking ahead at this point, but bye weeks start to hit um, really soon. Week five is the first week of buys, and you have a lot of good players on bye. You have the Lions, you have the Eagles, you have the Chargers, and the Titans. Those are all week five buys. So you have guys that are banged up right now, like Justin Herbert, the A.J. Browns, Devontae Smith. They'll likely miss this week, and then they get the bye week so that they'll be fully ready for the following week. So just keep that in mind as you are picking up players and as you're thinking about your roster and which guys will be available for the next week two weeks things like that Chicago Bears are not on a buy and this week or week five Cole Komet was on the opposite of a buy this previous week as he popped off for 11 targets 10 catches 97 yards and a touchdown that performance literally boosted him up to tight end three on the season after not really doing a fucking thing prior to it but now Cole Komet pretty much becomes like a borderline tight end one right now 
first thing I would say with the Chicago Bears offense is Caleb threw like 52 pass attempts. You will not see a game like that again this year for the Chicago offense. They've been without Keenan Allen. The problem coming into the year was that Cole Komet and Gerald Everett were like splitting snaps. Cole Komet has now overtaken Everett as the clear tight end. I can't believe like I can't believe they even wasted a single game or a snap of that being a predicament in that offense. Shane, Wal- Shane Waldron is going to ruin the Chicago offense all year long. So Cole Komet, he's someone I would target. I think uh, if I were going into the tight ends and just looking at guys that you can target or pick up, uh, guys that are not really rostered, Cole Komet would be the top of the list for me. The one name that's not on this list is Tucker Craft. Now, Tucker Craft has clearly overtaken Luke Musgrave as the top tight end in Green Bay. Jordan Love will make his return this week. I think Tucker Craft has as high of a ceiling or as much upside as anyone on the free agent list as it remains with tight ends right now. So for me, the rank would be Cole Komet, then Tucker Craft, followed closely by guys like Tyler Conklin, Zach Ertz. Like Conklin's coming off the big game, so everyone's like, oh, it's Conklin fucking season. But he's probably due for a three for 18 game, right? So he's one of those guys that just fits into that. Uh, tier of like you really have no idea what you're getting on a week-to-week basis Mike Gesicki does the same thing I mean Gesicki Zach Ertz Tyler Conklin I think are all solid like top 15 options Uh, Zach Ertz is probably my favorite out of those options to be honest with you because Zach Ertz has been a a nice floor play he's getting like four or five catches a week this is a defense in Washington that is horrible letting up a ton of points meaning Jaden Daniels continues to need to throw the ball at a very high rate so that's kind of the way I'm looking at tight ends. It's like Cole Komet's the clear one for me. And then you have a tier of guys where like Tucker Craft, I think, has the highest ups- upside as the guys remaining because he's attached to the best quarterback and the best offense. And then you have Ertz, Conklin, Gesicki, who are like probably higher floor guys, but don't really offer uh, a ton of a ceiling. As we make our way back to the real list here, we have Darnell Mooney, who's been cooking over there with Kirk. Like him and Kirk have a clear chemistry here. He had a bad week one, but that was the entire Atlanta offense, the entire Atlanta passing offense. TJ Watt literally ate our breakfast, lunch, and dinner throughout that game. But with better matchups, as you could see, Darnell Mooney went for 18 in week two. He went for nearly 15 last week, seeing a lot of targets, seeing a lot of downfield targets too. He's he's making big plays there, and he's running pretty much 100% of the routes in Atlanta. So Darnell Mooney is definitely one of the top wide receiver pickups this week outside of uh, Jawan Jennings. And I think he's probably playable in full PPR leagues off the rip as like a wide receiver three flex by week fill-in. Manuel Wilson looks pretty good. He's the Josh Jacobs handcuff. I don't think you're ever going to be able to play him really outside of uh, an injury to Josh Jacobs. So I won't go too in depth on that one. Roshan is one of the more interesting names on the list this week because DeAndre Swift is miserable. He, If he wasn't getting it going against his indie defense that didn't have DeForest Buckner, uh, there's no hope for him at this point. DeAndre Swift literally cannot see a hole if it was 17 feet wide. He, I don't know what he's looking at when he's running, but this was my concern coming into the year is that he's always been behind Detroit or Philly, which opens up these gaping holes. Chicago's not that. So if he needs to make plays by himself and like really be a vision type of guy, he ain't going to be able to get it done. And Roshan just randomly jumped Khalil Herbert in the pecking order. I wish they'd let Khalil get some spin, but it looks like Roshan is kind of supplanted Khalil Herbert as the RB2 here. He's a good pass catcher, too. Every time Chicago uses him in a pass catching role, he ends up catching like four or five passes a game. Uh, He's more efficient on the ground at this point than DeAndre Swift is. And I think when you have a guy like Swift, what I'd be looking at or thinking about if I was Chicago is like, we're already, you know, hurting enough on offense. DeAndre Swift is giving us so many negative plays. At this point, we're just looking for guys that are not going to fuck up. And that's what Roshan Johnson does. He is a dude that he's not a great running back by any means. He's not going to give you a bunch of explosive plays, but he's a dude that won't fuck up. Like if you design a run that will get you three or four yards, DeAndre Swift is getting you like negative one yards on those runs. Roshan Johnson will get you the three or four yards. Okay. So I think maybe they're looking to continue to put more stability around Caleb Williams. And maybe that's why we see Cole Komet getting more play time. That's why we see Roshan Johnson. So Roshan's a dude that I think could actually take over this backfield and can contribute on all three downs as DeAndre Swift continues to be one of the worst investments of any NFL team this offseason. So Roshan is a sneaky, sneaky ad that I would probably throw between like four or five, six, seven ish percent, somewhere in that range where it's like the five to seven percent fab where it's like you don't want someone to get them for nothing. But at the same time, like next week, we could go back to a, a three way committee. So you have to, you know, weigh these things on a spectrum. Look at the upside, look at the downside, look at the offense overall. The interior blocking is still bad, but we saw some hope for the offense. So maybe they start clicking a little bit more. They get a great matchup against the Rams. So like, you know, I, I think Roshan's definitely someone to keep an eye on. Jalen Naylor continues to score touchdowns literally every single week, and it is slowly deteriorating my heart health as a Jordan Addison owner. Uh, but he looks good. 
and he's making it happen. And everyone's like, oh, Jordan Addison might be back this week. Jordan Addison hasn't even been limited in a single practice since hurting his ankle. So sure, maybe he is a miracle worker and comes back this week. But if I had to put it on one side of 50-50, I would say Jordan Addison's probably out again. So uh, Jalen Naylor, I think you could definitely do worse than him. Calvin Austin, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pass on him. Al Lazard, it looks like he's got real chemistry with Aaron Rodgers. I hate, like, God, I hate suggesting Al Lazard. I think he's such a boring name, and I think we've seen, like, what he really is. But if he's going to keep putting up points like this, 27 in week one, 14 last week, he's not getting a ton of targets, like three targets this week, four targets the week before that. But if Aaron Rodgers is slinging it the way that he is, and he loves Al Lazard, and there's so many teams that now just focus on stopping Garrett Wilson. Rodgers came out in the press conference afterwards and were like, teams are just doubling Garrett. It's hard to get him the ball. This will probably be no different here uh, with Denver and Patrick Sertan, who just sticks to the number one receiver. He will probably follow Garrett Wilson all across the field, meaning it leaves the rest of the field open for guys like Alan Lazard, maybe Mike Williams a little bit. I'd rather own Lazard at this point. Obviously, we've seen the chemistry be super, super real here. Um, so Lazard, I guess, is worth a stash because the matchup is good. Speaking on the Jets here, like this, Braylon Allen, if he's available in your league, that's an unserious league. Same thing with Bucky Irving. Like, I know I have to mention them just because people are like, what about Braylon Allen? Yeah, like they are the top pickups if they are available for you. They are dudes who have unbelievable upside if the starter in front of them gets hurt. I think Braylon and Bucky are both starting to work themselves into uh, standalone value within the next like few weeks where they should be getting enough work because they played so well that you are – looking at them as standalone-ish with un unreal upside if something happens to the guy in front of them. So those guys need to be owned in every single league, no doubt about it. Tutu Atwell is another interesting name. While everybody was like super, super uh, in their fucking panties about Demarcus Robinson, that felt like a, a trap game. Like Demarcus Robinson is not built to be a real wide receiver one in an offense. And Tutu is like one of the guys that's left in this offense that can get separation around the line of scrimmage. And he popped off five targets, four catches, 93 yards. Uh, big game here. And I think Tutu will probably be one of the better fantasy wide receivers in L.A. as this offense is without Cup and Puka for the time being. They have a really tough matchup in Chicago, though. Chicago's defense is super, super legit. So wouldn't expect much this week, but he's still probably uh, right in that same tier with Demarcus Robinson in terms of guys that I want to own in that receiving group. Keep moving down. Unserious leagues after unserious leagues. Tyler, is it Batty or Bidet? Someone, someone literally like corrected me on my video yesterday as I did the week by week recap or the game by game recap for week three and said it was bidet as in like the toilet thing. I think it's Batty, Tyler Beatty, Tyler Beatty. I think that's what it is. I think it's Tyler Beatty. Uh, anyways, Tyler Beatty randomly just saw nine carries. He got, he, he started to get semi worked in at the end of the Pittsburgh game. And now they are, like, Sean Payton just has a thing for dudes for five foot eight running backs under 200 pounds. Beatty is the next guy up here. He ended up almost matching the carry total of Javante Angelo McLaughlin in this game. He got nine carries, 70 yards. You're talking about 7.8 yards per carry. He's explosive. He runs a 4.45, where Jaleel and Javante each had five carries apiece and looked pretty miserable doing it. So I think he's worth taking a stab on. I don't think this is an offense that you want to like tie a lot of fucking horses to. I don't think this is an offense with a backfield that has a ton of upside right now, the way they're moving the ball. It was a really good matchup against Tampa Bay, who was super depleted on their offense or the defensive line. No Vita Vea, no Klaja Kansi, like really, really depleted. So I think the matchup was top tier, although it didn't really look like that on paper. So uh, Beatty could end up being, you know, a guy who gets four carries next week for 15 yards. So he's someone I'd like to stash it to see if something happens here. But I probably wouldn't spend more than like one to two percent of my fab, one to three percent of my fab in that range. Alexander Madison is a handcuff, I guess, to Samir White in like the league's worst rushing game. So you could cut him if you need to. But I mean, I guess I'd rather own him than not. But whatever. Rico Dowdle has overtaken the backfield in Dallas right now. The whole theory, like Rico Dowdle is such a mid running back, but he looks like Chris Johnson out there after a Zeke carry. The whole thesis behind wanting this Dallas backfield was that they were such a high scoring offense. And they're like starting to score points because they keep putting up points in garbage time, which inflates their stats. But it's all through the air. Rigo Dow is running more routes. He is getting more carries, but like it's nothing of value. If you can drop Zeke for Rico, you're definitely doing that. Rico seems to be the back to own there. But like, I don't know when we see a game where Rico is startable. Maybe it's against the Giants. That's a relatively good matchup. 
But the Dallas team overall is really fragile right now. Like they're having trouble running their offense through CD Lamb. They can't do it through the run game, obviously. And their defense is not even close to what it's been in previous years. So Rico, like, sure, he could take over the backfield, but I don't even know what that means. Like it, if, if Zeke was out for the next three weeks, like I still don't feel that good about starting Rico as anything more than like a flex play because is he going to score touchdowns? Is anything going to happen? He's the one to own back there, but like I don't, I'm not super excited about owning him to begin with. Um, Michael Wilson needs to be called out, as do the next two players. So Michael Wilson, one of my goats. I really need to get a, a Michael Wilson jersey to be honest with you. Uh, Michael Wilson is coming off a, a big game last week: nine targets, eight catches, 64 yards. Now Trey McBride suffered a concussion. As we know, concussions, you're, the player to play next week is probably a little bit less than 50-50. So on average, the player misses one week when they suffer concussion. Some guys come back. So 50-50 chance that McBride is not playing next week. They have a mwah, beautiful matchup against Washington. So I expect Michael Wilson to be a big part of that passing game again. And I, I think Michael Wilson, if Trey McBride misses, Michael Wilson becomes a plug-and-play wide receiver three off the rip. I think he's someone that you could actually put into your lineup if you are desperate at the wide receiver or flex position in PPR leagues. In deeper leagues, I think you can also look at the Arizona receiving group. Like Greg Dortch, I think, makes a little bit of sense over the middle. Like this Washington secondary is so bad that both him and Elijah Higgins will be the next tight end up there. He'll run every route. I don't know if he's going to fucking do anything, but I just thought it would make sense to make note of it because some of y'all playing deep, 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 deep leagues. And all of these players, in terms of my rankings of where I'd actually put them relative to other players, my exact fab suggestion in terms of percentage, all that kind of stuff is available in our waiver wire rankings, which is up right now on bdge.co. If you're a Big Dog member, you get access to this, our weekly rankings for sit starts, our private Q&A every Saturday where I answer your sit starts uh, on a YouTube video only for y'all. And um, you can sign up on bdge.co. It is a monthly membership, like I said. But again, if you go to underdogfantasy.com or just download the Underdog Fantasy app on your phone and you deposit $10 or more using code BDGE, you will get access to the Big Dog membership for free for the rest of the season, okay? For the rest of the season, you will get all of our rankings. So Underdog Fantasy, download it with code BDGE, $10 or more, or just go through BDGE.co. Coral Patterson's another interesting one because Jalen Warren left this game and they are getting an MRI on his knee. I haven't seen or heard any updates. Maybe it's not serious. Maybe it is serious. But Coral Patterson is getting an uncomfortable amount of work now, okay? And uh, he's looking pretty damn good doing it. So he had three catches this previous week, four carries, 33 yards. If Jalen Warren is out, and this is an indie defense that is so depleted, no DeForest Buckner, their best run defender, uh, they have been just absolutely gashed in the trenches. I think Coriel Patterson will be a, a sneaky, sneaky good start this week as Najee Harris continues to just like literally roll to 65 yards on 20 carries every week. Like Arthur Smith loves Coriel Patterson, as he should. I love Coriel Patterson. You love Coriel Patterson. There's nobody that doesn't fucking love Coriel Patterson. This week in particular, though, Cordy P is a sneaky, sneaky good pickup if Jalen Warren misses time. Chuba, unserious leagues. Quentin Johnson, unserious leagues. Jacoby, unserious. All these guys, unserious. Okay, some other names to keep an eye on that are not on the trending list. I think when we look at Carolina, Carolina gets a fantastic matchup against Cincinnati. Dalton obviously is just injected like drugs. He has injected life back into that Carolina team. They looked fantastic. Adam Thielen pulled up in that touchdown catch with a what looks like a relatively severe hamstring strain, which means it's going to give way to some receiver to step up behind Deontay Johnson. Someone else has got to get targets there. So... Mingo and Xavier Leggett. Leggett was their first round pick. Mingo was a top 35 pick for them a year ago. Mingo was running more routes. So I think if you wanted to play, if you wanted to play big brain, I think Leggett might be a better player than Mingo. But if you want to follow the numbers and the routes and the snaps and stuff like that, it points towards Mingo. He is the one running more routes than Leggett right now. Maybe they don't feel like Leggett is ready. Maybe Leggett's not that good of a player. But he is athletically a freak. He is really gifted. He makes crazy, crazy good plays. So I think you could sprinkle 1%, 2 3% on either of those guys and kind of see how this game against Cincinnati plays out. And then with Philly, because they have a week five bye, I think there's a really good chance that they end up Missing Devontae Smith because he's a concussion. That's not really up to them. But sitting A.J. Brown for another week, rest the hamstring. That way he's fully healthy when they come back in week six, which opens up the receiver core to be Jahan Dotson, who has been just straight ass this year, but he's running every single route. And then Johnny Wilson. I think Johnny Wilson's like a sneaky, sneaky ad 
if you are desperate. Now, anyone that you're adding from this offense, from this passing offense, outside of the, the key staple players, obviously, of like Goddard, et cetera, are one-week players at that if A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith miss. Because, again, one game, by Both of them are probably back after that. So uh, if you're really desperate, you could look that way. Let's talk about some streaming defenses real quick. Uh, I cannot imagine that the Vikings are available, but regardless, the way I look at streaming defenses, and this works at like an 80% clip, if you're streaming a defense, you want to look at a few things. One, you want your team to be favored in that game. Like you want the defense that you're playing, the team that you're playing to be the favorite to win that game. Like for instance, Minnesota, they're two point, they're two and a half point underdogs in this game. I don't want to stream a team that's expected to lose their game. Okay. So that one's off the rip. You want to look at teams that are favored. You want to look at teams that have home games. So playing at home is a huge advantage, which usually goes into the spread. So, you know, if so facto, and you want to look at bigger spread, all right. Uh, the bigger the spread, the, the bigger the favorite they are, the more probably passing the other team's going to have to do, which leads to sacks, interceptions, turnovers, and things like that. So as we look at the rest of the trending defensive teams, we've got Houston. I would be shocked if they're available, but they're obviously a great stream if they are. They are six-point favorites at home against a really, really struggling Jacksonville team. They would be at top of my list if they are available. You have New Orleans at Atlanta. Now, the Saints are two two-point underdogs. I think this is a terrible stream, to be honest with you. They've obviously played well, and I will say I don't think it's a the worst stream if both of the offensive linemen that Atlanta lost on that Sunday night game against Kansas City do end up missing time. Caleb Gary and Drew Dahlman, two of our starting O linemen, went down and that's when all the KC pressure ended up hitting the backfield. Uh so if we miss both of those dudes, then maybe the Saints could be a better streaming option, but right now they're not one of my favorite teams to stream this week. We've got Pittsburgh at Indy, they're eighty seven percent owned, so unserious league. The Jets are seven-point favorites at home against Denver, so they're probably pretty highly owned. San Francisco, 10-point favorites at home against the Patriots. Arizona, three-and-a-half-point favorites at home against the Commanders, though I don't typically like to play, even if they fit my criteria, I don't like to play teams that I know just straight up are bad defenses, which would be Arizona. And then lastly, we've got the Titans and the Dolphins game. Now, this is an over-under of 37 points. I actually think you could probably stream both teams, both defenses, because it'll be low scoring. Will Levis is a turnover machine. On the flip side, Tennessee is at home. Their defense is actually good, filled with a lot of good personnel, and they're playing whoever Miami decides to start. It's probably leaning towards Snoop Huntley. Um, Scott Thompson got hurt. Either way, he was horrible. Tim Boyle was horrible. I can't imagine you try either of those two guys out there. Regardless, Snoop Huntley ain't ain't much better. So uh, I would probably lean Tennessee over Miami, but I think either of them are worthwhile all right let's run down the drop list real quick uh demarcus robinson i would not be dropping i still think he's going to run 100 percent of the routes better days are ahead i wouldn't start him this week against chicago but i wouldn't drop him acres i definitely wouldn't drop either because i don't think it's a guarantee that mixon and or pierce play this upcoming week strange i'm fine dropping down to foreman i'm fine dropping whittington you could drop zeke He eats up the Giants, but probably droppable. Ty Johnson, droppable. Adonai Mitchell, unfortunately, yeah, he was down to like 9% of the routes with Josh Downs returning, so he's droppable. Zach Ertz, definitely not. High floor player in PPR leagues. Uh, Samaja P. Ryan, I think he's definitely droppable if you super, super need the spot. Um, He was out-touched like 18-9. to Carson Steele, uh, Kareem Hunt will probably be active this week. Clyde is eligible to return in week five, so it gets messy really, really quickly. P. Ryan's not playing anything except the long down and distance snaps, so like he's his his upside is useless. Gus Edwards, definitely droppable. Blake Corum, still the handcuff to Kyron, so I think if you own Kyron, you could keep him. Otherwise, I don't think he needs to be taking up a roster spot for you. Romeo Dobbs, I'd hold on to with Jordan Love coming back. Colby Parkinson, I'd hold on to. Henry, bad game. But that again, like that's what's going to happen. All, none of these tight ends are consistent. I'd hold on to him. Gabe Davis, I'm fine dropping. Keon, I would hold on to. Jerry Judy, I'd hold on to. Warren, I would wait for the injury news. If he's out against Indy, I think he's okay to drop during bye weeks. Definitely don't drop, drop Mark Andrews. Tank Bigsby, ugh, you can drop him if you need to. Cream Hunt, hold on to. Johnny Smith drop, Brandon Cooks I'd hold on to, Polk is a drop, Downs I'd hold, Benson I'd hold, Swift, man, I, I guess I'd hold for one more week just to, just to make sure that Roshan Johnson kind of like took the job there, but Ingram definitely hold on to, Hill you could drop, Pierce you could drop, I guess, uh, Reynolds you could drop, Javante I'd hold on for one more week to see what the split looks like, Ladd I'd hold on to. Gasicki would hold on to. Khalil Herbert, you could drop. Steele had 18 touches in the Kansas City offense. That's an unserious drop. Thielen, 
yeah, unfortunately, he's going to be out for a few weeks. I think he's such a good player with Dalton under center, but who knows when that's going to be. Greg Dortch, I would stash this week if you need to play him because they get a great matchup, and McBride, like I said, is probably out. So that's what we got for week three of the waiver wire. All right. So I'll leave you with that. Hopefully this was helpful. There's no like super, super prized possession unless the guys like Juwan, Braylon Allen, Bucky Irving are available on your waiver wire outside of that. Pretty uninspiring. And I would once again, let my idiot league mates spend their fab. Okay. If you are not on underdog fantasy yet, again, you can get that free square of Patrick Mahomes one passing yard on the week using promo code BDGE when you deposit $10 or more. They'll hit you with a deposit bonus. You'll get that free square. You'll get access to the Big Dog membership for the entire season for free on that. Otherwise, you could head to BDGE.co to get our waiver wire rankings. That's all for me. I will see you bike here tomorrow. Smoke cheese.